should be very familiar with that passage of Scripture, but we'll start in Hebrews uh, where we started out this series by faith. Uh, just to show you just a couple things before we go back to Genesis. Uh, there in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 17. And then we'll go back to the book of Genesis to pick up that storyline. It says by verse 17 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, the word tried uh, mean, it could also mean tested. Uh, that's what it means. And many times in the King James Version, that's literally what it says. He said by, he was tested, offered up Isaac, and, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now notice verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That's very important. Okay, because God's always interested in preserving a seed. Abraham had to believe uh, that Isaac was that seed. Okay, he was that seed. Okay, uh, in bringing Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to this earth. Uh, and understand, as, understand, he had to believe that Isaac, by faith, that Isaac was that seed that was called by God. As you go back and you look at the setting for Genesis chapter 22. He says, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up. Okay, there again, he's going back to that Genesis account. He had to believe in what he's about to do in Genesis 22 that if that God would raise him up. And everything you see in Genesis 22 is really a portrait of, of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when you look at Abraham and you look at Isaac. Accounting that God was able to raise him up. He had to believe that if, listen, that if he took his life there on that altar, that God would raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Okay, so keep that in mind. He is a figure. Isaac was a figure. Uh, Abraham and Isaac's story is a figure of the father and the son and the father raising up his son Jesus Christ on the third day from the grave. Okay, so that's another storyline, but that's what he's referring to. So to go back and look, what was it that uh, we need to see about Abraham's faith? It says in chapter 22, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or test Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and arose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Notice that. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of the heaven, and he said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither thou do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, then in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of, he of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed 
seed, there it is again, that seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Well, really what we see in this series by faith, we see faith's defining moment. Uh, each of us can pinpoint some defining moment in every one of our lives. Uh, maybe it was our salvation experience. We can pinpoint uh, that experience. Maybe it was in our marriage. We can pinpoint that. It was a, a defining moment in our life. Uh, maybe it was a child being born. Uh, maybe it was a graduation or receiving a degree. Maybe it was getting a new job. But we can go on and on giving different examples or illustrations of the fact of defining moments in our life. Uh, just looking back for a few moments at some folks in the Old Testament, I, I think about Joseph to define a moment. Joseph's define a moment was in prison, wasn't it? When he was called up to interpret dreams, and we know that he began to escalate, and he began to find position, and he was able to minister through a time of famine. Moses' defining moment was at the burning bush uh, when he was there and God spoke to him out of that bush. It was a supernatural phenomena that God spoke to him there at that burning bush. It was a defining moment. It changed his life. David's defining moment was when he was uh, the two, uh, two uh, countries were at war. Uh, the Philistines, listen, were on one side. The children of Israel were on the other. And we know that the, the Valley of Elah lay between. And here this giant is almost 10 foot tall comes out uh, by the name of Goliath. And it was a, it was a defining moment in his life when he got, grabbed that uh, sling stone, uh, slingshot and those stones and he whirled it and popped him between the eyeballs and he fell face first. Uh, Daniel's uh, defining moment was refusing to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's in you, image when he constructed it and said everyone that does not bow uh, there there will be uh, whatever take place in the lion's den or the fiery furnace so you see uh, every one of these individuals face some defining moments and guess what if you serve God you you've either had some defining moments or you're going to face some defining moments keep in mind when you look at chapter 21 and chapter 22 of Genesis uh, somewhere around 20 years has transpired between chapter 21 and chapter 22 uh, Abraham now in, in chapter 22 is somewhere about uh, probably around the age of 100 years old as you read that. And, and keep in mind, somebody said the first 40 years gives us uh, the text. The next 30 give us the commentary. And that could be true as you look at his life. The commentary has been written as we listen to God and obey his directions one day at a time for every one of our lives. And there's defining moments in every one of our lives. You see, after 40 years, notice the, the, the verse 1 is key. It said, and it came to pass after these things, okay? That's very inter instrumental because we're looking back. We're looking back to the, those previous years, and now we're seeing a new era of his life. Uh, God, After 40 years of walking with God, Abram's faith is going to be put to the ultimate test. Uh, when you read that phrase, after all these things, it's literally like saying, after all the things he's experienced up until now, we're getting ready to see the climax of his faith. And you see, every one of our lives, whether we realize or not, uh, there's a climax in our walk with God and our fellowship with him uh, in this thing we call faith. Uh, God had been preparing Abraham for this moment all along. And after 40 years of walking with God, Abraham's faith is put to the ultimate test. You see, keep in mind that God always tests us to bring out the best in us. Satan, as you've heard me say many times, tempts us to bring out the worst in us. Folks, if God never tested us, we'd never grow. We'd stay in the same place. We'd live in the same rut. And we'd reach the same level of maturity in our walk with God. The more we experience faith, the more ex trials and uh, things we go through, the more uh, apt we are to grow and develop who we are as men and women of God. And we can help others along the way. Well... Now, I want you to notice in chapter 22, this was a, a defining moment for Abraham's will. First of all, uh, it says that God did tempt or test Abraham and said unto Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Uh, verse 2 said, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest. Don't, don't miss that. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And get thee in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. I'll tell thee of. 
But I want you to notice verse 3, 2 and 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he sat on his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Keep in mind, first of all, we see his path is encouraged. I want you to keep his path is encouraged. Uh, he, he's told by God to, he, he makes himself available. He says, behold, here I am. As if God didn't know where he was at. God knew where he was at all the time. He'd seen what had went on in his life. He knew he was right where God wanted him. But he says, here I am. We see he realizes, listen, his path, though, is encouraged because of his avail availability. He said, take thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And you go to the land of Moriah and there on one of the mountains I'll tell thee of. Uh, very important. We see his path is encouraged. But secondly, we see his promptness is evident. And notice it says that Abraham rose up early in the morning. He didn't waste any time, folks. His promptness is evident. You see, I, keep in mind that Isaac, as you read Hebrews, Isaac is the key to everything God's promised. And Abraham's being asked to give Isaac up. Everything that God's promised him, he is, he's pursuing him to give it up. Listen, he, Isaac is to be that seed that's been promised to the, to the people of God. And knowing that God had made him a promise, notice he obeyed without hesitation. That says something about his faith. He didn't whine. He didn't moan. He didn't question God. Sure, there had to be some type of suspense in his heart and life, but he rose up early in the morning. He made the preparations he needed, but I want you to notice, and verse 3 says, and he went unto the place of which God had told him. Notice that phrase. That's very important. Listen, Abraham didn't dream up. Listen, he didn't dream up his own plan and then ask God to bless it. He knew that God was leading him and directing him every step of the way. Uh, he did, And folks, so many times we're not careful. We come up, up with our own plan and we, then we ask God to bless it somewhere down the road. And we can't do that. Uh, if this thing of walking by faith, God has to lead us and guide us and direct us. And ladies and gentlemen, our walk with God must be guided by prayer. It must be by, guided by the Word of God. God. It must be guided by the Spirit of God. And we have to be led step by step till we get to that place where God wants us. So the place which God had told him is a very important statement. It reminds you and I, again, we can't dream up our own plan. We can't do our own will and then ask God to bless it. Uh, so important in this thing of the defining moment. Uh, it was a defining moment for Abra Abraham's will. God's, what's God doing? God is breaking his will so that he'll be submissive to the total will of God. You see, before he can be the father of many nations, he's got to learn to trust God fully by faith. Secondly, this was a defining moment for Abraham's mind. Uh, look at verse 4 and verse 5. Uh, the Bible says, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. Uh, and Abraham said unto his young men, he says, You abide here uh, with, a, with an ass, and I and the lad go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham, he took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And notice this next phrase. And they went both of them together. Huh. What a powerful statement. Can you imagine what may have been going through his mind as you read these verses? Well, as you read these verses, uh, keep in mind, why, why would God be asking, uh, Abraham may have been asking, why would God ask me uh, to kill the only leak between uh, himself and a nation uh, which was to be the blessing of the whole world? If Isaac is the seed uh, of the future uh, of the nation to come, why is he asking me to do this? Well, we get light shed on that as we've just read Hebrews. We see uh, Hebrews 11, verse 17 to verse 19 gives us the answer I've just read to you. You see, Hebrews 11, verse 17 ver ver through verse 19 uh, tells us exactly what he was thinking. You see, uh, keep in mind that Mount Moriah was about five miles from Beersheba. And it would take three days' journey to travel. Can you imagine walking for three days with your son? You're walking with this son. And by the way, uh, understand that uh, Isaac by this time, some say he had to probably be around maybe uh, between 30 and 33 years of age, uh, which was the age of the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably so. He wasn't a little kid. He's a, he's a grown adolescent man. Uh, keep in mind. And can you imagine walking for three days knowing you're going to put your son on the altar, knowing you're going to kill your son? 
Well, you, you see, Abraham used three words to describe this occasion. Look, if you will, in verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, uh, Abide ye here with the, with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder. And, and do what? Worship. This was an act of worship, unadulterated worship between, listen, for not only Isaac, he would become the sacrifice, but listen, Abraham would present the sacrifice, and it had to be acceptable to God. God's told him to do this. He hasn't dreamed this up. God's led him, and he's guided him in this particular occasion and in his life. It's about, first of all, it's about worship. It's, it's about worship. Well, what, what is he doing in this worship? How do we see worship? How is it portrayed? What do we see? First of all, you know what worship is? It's giving God your best. Uh, Abraham was given, listen, he was given his only son. He was given that son that was dear to him. And we know that there was another one, but this one was dear to his heart. He's given up, given God his best. You know, there's a lot of different words for worship. Uh, different ideas as you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. But that's what worship is, is giving God your best, as base and as simple as you can get it. And then secondly, the word worship literally means to come face to face with. That's exactly what he's doing. He's coming face to face with God. But he's also giving God his best. He's giving him his son, that part of his bloodline. Uh, it almost, the word worship also means to show worth to. He's, he's coming and he's saying, God, you're, you're worthy. If you want my son, if you want my son, he's yours. He belongs to you anyhow because you gave him to me. But I, I, I'll be willing to give him back to you so that I can be obedient. So many pictures here of the Father and the Son of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it means to, Lily, to bow the knee. It means to bow the knee. But you see, he was bowing more than the knee, ladies and gentlemen. He was bowing the heart. It's no good to bow the knee if you don't bow the heart. When you come face to face, you, you, listen, worship is to show his worth. Not our, it's not about us. It's about him. It's to, show, it's to show the worth of Jesus. It's to come face to face with. It's to bow the knee. It's to give God your best. And I wonder how many times that we give God our best. Well, then it, the, the second word we use here to describe this occasion as he makes his way up to Mount Moriah here to lay him on this altar uh, is in verse 7. And Isaac spake to Abraham his father and he said my father and he said here am I my son and he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb notice this phrase where is the lamb for a burnt offering. There it is the second word is offering. It's offering. Isaac knew that there had to be an offering. Isaac knew enough about worship. He had seen his father worship many times. He had set the example and the pattern. He knew what the example was and the pattern of worship. And he knew that something was missing. There was the fire. There was the wood. Everything they needed for, listen, to produce that offering except for a lamb. Isaac knew there had to be a lamb. And let me just say this. If there's anything our kids and grandkids ought to know, they ought to know something about our worship. They need to know what an offering is. They need to see us offering ourselves sacrificially to the Lord Jesus Christ without any question they need to see us offering ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ Isaac knew there had to be a lamb hey and our lives ought to point our children and grandchildren and our friends to the dear lamb of God amen and then there had to be thirdly look we see the next word to describe this occasion it, this occasion was not only about worship and it's about an offering but look in verse 9 and they came to the place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar. There it is. It's about an altar. It's a, an altar there. And he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the Lord. You see, every one of us, you see, we ought to have an altar in our life. And that's why it's so important that we have an altar at church because this is where we can lay ourselves before a holy God and get things right. We can confess our sin. We can bring our sorrows. We can bring our pains. It's a place that we can intercede for others. It's a place that we can come and we can humble ourselves. We can bow our knee. We can show our word to Him. We can come face to face with Him. We can give God our best. We, listen, we can come to the Lamb of God because we're one of His children. Uh, listen, we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. I want you to understand something as we look at this picture here. I want you to keep in mind that Abraham was not going in blind obedience to obey God. He was going up that mountain. He was going up to Mount Moriah. Listen, he was, wasn't going in blind obedience. 
in his obedience to God. He was going to worship God. He's going to worship God. He's doing the hardest thing he had ever had to do in his life. That's what made it a true act of worship. You know, we live in a culture when we want easy worship, don't we? We want easy worship. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing easy about real, genuine worship. Somebody's got to sacrifice. And if we're going to experience real worship in our lives, it's going to take sacrifice. That's the whole story behind what we're seeing here. And you see, we can't sacrifice without faith. Well, this was not only a defining moment for Abraham's will. It was a defining moment for Abraham's mind. Can you imagine what's going through his mind as his son begins to ask him these questions as, as they make this journey around about five miles? I imagine every now and then it got quiet. Every now and then it got quiet till Isaac asked these questions. And here we find that uh, Abraham's pondering what, how he's going to answer. Uh, but, but you see that intimacy here. Uh, keep in mind that everything's by faith. Not only is Abraham walking by faith but ladies and gentlemen he has a son also that's following in his step and he's learned a whole lot about faith and now he also is walking by faith you see it's going to take faith for him to lay on that altar amen to offer up himself as a sacrifice it was a defining moment for abraham's mind but it was also a defining moment for abraham's heart <laughs> look at verse 10 the Bible says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. Now keep in mind, when you see the word, the term angel of the Lord, it's what we call a theophany. A theophany is really, in biblical terms, it's just a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, we know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all in existence, and we know that this is a, a pre-Calvary experience, or pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, okay? So keep that in mind. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. He said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am I. And by the way, this is one of the double calls you find in the scriptures. There are several different ones where you see the person's name called out twice. There's significance of that. First of all, look at verse 10 and 11. We see God's silence is broken. God's silence is broken. Up until then, this has been a conversation between Abraham and Isaac, hadn't it? We hadn't heard much from God, but now we see. Uh, we but we see here. We see God's interest in His people. He's interested in what's going on. He's interested in what Abraham's doing with his son. Listen, everything, ever bit of the, ever bit of the scope of this occasion. He's interested in His people. He's interested in Abraham's faith. He's interested in Isaac's faith. He's interested in, in sacrifice. He's interested in worship. He's interested in this offering. He's interested in this altar. And can I say he's interested in how we worship? He's interested in what we do or what we don't do, ladies and gentlemen. He's interested in his people. And then secondly, we see in this call, double call God's intimacy with his people. He's not calling him here to rebuke him. He's calling him to let him know, hey, I'm with you all the way, bud. I'm right here with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm right here with you. I know what's going on. I haven't asked you to do this to, uh, just, to, uh, just to be dreaming up something to do. Listen, I have a purpose in what you're doing. So we see God's intimacy here with these people. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Listen, when I, when I can't get what I need, listen, from anywhere else, I'm glad there's intimacy with me and God, and I can get what I need when I need it. I'm glad I can go, listen, to the throne of grace, and He can love on me when I'm discouraged and defeated, when I don't know the direction to take, which way to go. I'm glad that He has an answer. Amen. How about you? I'm glad. I think one of the things we fail to teach people today in most of our churches is how to be intimate with God. You see, because Jesus said, if you don't love him with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, he said, listen, you're not worthy of him. <laughs> and one of the things we fail to do is we fail to teach people how to be intimate with Jesus Christ. And then we see, thirdly, in this double call, not only God's interest in his people, but God's intimacy with, with his people, but God's intervention for men. You see, he's getting ready to intervene in the situation. So God's silence is broken. But then when you get to verse 12 and verse 13, you see God's solution is given. Uh, and he said, as he stretched forth his hand and he took the knife to slay his son, he's in the, he, everything's in motion. Everything's right where it needs to be. Uh, Abraham's here. He's, he's, he's in total, total obedience. And, it's, and the Bible says that the angel spoke unto him and called him. 
signifying that his presence was there, and he gives the solution. And look what he said in verse 12. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. But notice this next statement. For now I know that thou fearest God. Ladies and gentlemen, he just passed the test, didn't he? He just passed the ultimate test of walking by faith. Now I know. He says, now I know that thou fearest God. Now I know that you respect what I have to say. Now I know that you trust me. Now I know that you believe me. Now that I know that you'll go to the extreme to honor me with your life. Now I know that it's more than talk with you between me and you. Now I know that you're totally committed to where I lead you and guide you and direct you. And now you're ready to be the father of many nations. He says, Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. You see, God's solution is given. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked, and we see verse 13. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And I've taught, and you may have heard me say before, I've been taught through the years that uh, on one side there was a ram walking up Mount Moriah, and on the other side uh, there was a lamb. I, I don't necessarily believe that's true because in the sovereignty of God, God already had strategically placed that ram there, and his rams were caught, his horns were caught in that thicket, and he was waiting for the time of God. God already had the sacrifice waiting. All he wanted to do was get Abraham to trust him by faith. What, you see, what is that? we see that God's substitutes provided in verse 13, verse 14. Uh, that ram was caught in that thicket. And Abraham called the name of that place, verse 14, Jehovah Jireh. And it said today, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. As you think about the conclusion of what's happening here, folks, as we learn, look at Abraham's life by faith. What do we learn? It's our responsibility to obey God and God's responsibility to provide. Don't forget that. It's not our responsibility to provide. He's already provided a lamb. It's our responsibility to obey and God's responsibility to provide. That's what we see through Abraham's faith. And let me just say this, and again, another application we might make. If we wait, if we wait until we see every solution to, and provision, uh, we've turned back to walking by sight. God don't always show us what he's going to do up front. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting God as his word. We don't know all the results. We don't know all the consequences. We can't see in the future like he does. We're to be obedient. Listen, one step and one day, one moment at a time. God will take care of tomorrow. We're to live for him today. Abraham, if we wait until we can see every solution and every provision, we've turned to walking by sight and not by faith. There's just some things, I'll be honest with you, you're not going to figure out. You're not going to have the answer ahead of time. I'm speaking by experience. You see, Abraham had to completely trust by faith that God would provide himself a sacrifice as he made his way up to Mount Moriah. We learn another truth from Abraham here in this subject matter by faith, and it's this. We're never too old to face new challenges you say, well, they live longer in the Old Testament. Well, they did, okay? But it's 100 years old, still 100 years old, amen? I don't care how you do the math. It's 100 years old. Uh, we're never too old to face new challenges. Never too old to fight new battles. Never too old to learn new truths. You see, when we quit, get to the place where we think we can't be taught anything by God or from His Word, we're in a, we're in a dangerous arena. Because when we, when we begin to quit learning, we quit growing. When we stop learning, we quit growing. We, when we stop growing, we stop, listen, we stop living by faith. Don't miss that statement. Because <laughs> it puts the ice on every bit of the cake of this thing by faith. When we stop learning, we stop growing. When we stop growing, we stop living by faith. By faith. The Father and the Son work together to offer a sacrifice. Verse 6 and verse 8. You see that coming to fruition as I've read. Uh, Abraham took the wood, uh, laid it upon the Isaac, his son. He took the knife in his hand, a knife. And notice this phrase, and they went both of them together. Notice verse 8. Once again, it says they both, they went both of them together. 
You see, there's a great portrait here of the Father and the Son in this Old Testament story. You see, the Father and the Son are always in agreement. And let me just put the ice on it. Listen. And by the way, this word, it'll always agree with what the Father says and what the Son says. The Father and the Son always agree. And the Bible will never contradict what the Father and the Son. And by the way, the Bible will never contradict what the Holy Spirit says. And that's why it has to be by faith. By faith, the Father and the Son work together to offer a sacrifice. And we see the outcome. You see, Abraham came away from this test with a deeper love for God, for the Lord. I'm reminded of a New Testament passage I want to read for you right quick. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14. Listen to John chapter 14 as we, may, as we flip over and make an application to you and I tonight in closing. Uh, John 14, verse 21. And through verse 24, John 14. I'm sorry, I had that mark and moved it. Listen to verse 21 through verse 24. He said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, how does that relate to Abraham and Isaac? Nowhere did Abraham dream up what he, God wanted him to do for him. Nowhere did he dream up that he was to go to Mount Moriah and offer his son. God distinctly told him what to do and how, how he is to worship. He that hath, hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. Listen, and I will love him, and I will manifest. That word manifest means to reveal openly. I will reveal myself to him. So simply he says, hey, anybody that loves my father will be loved of me. And I'm, if he, a person that loves my father, I'm going to love him or her. And, and because they love my father and they love me and our love is, is, is linked together, I am going to reveal myself to that individual. And then Judas Iscariot said to him, uh, uh, Judas said to him, not Iscariot, excuse me, Lord, how is it that will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sins, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you. Wow. And then he goes on to talk about the comfort of the paracletos, the Holy Spirit. So bottom line, Abraham came away from this experience, from this test, with a deeper love for the Lord. You see, when we go to stories like this, you know what ought to happen to us? We too ought to come away tonight with a deeper love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to come away realizing that God, in whatever situation we're in, we find that little phrase there in that scripture, and God will provide. Don't know what you're going through. Don't know what you're facing. Don't want to know what you need spiritually, financially, maritally, emotionally. But listen, you stay close. and You keep your ear tuned in. Uh, you keep yourself in the path of God. And we've, we have the promises of God that God will provide. Abraham trusted by faith. Whatever happened, whatever the result was, as he made his way on that journey, he trusted that God would provide. And that's what he said to his son. And guess what? We see that God did provide, but it all come back to verse 18 for one simple reason. It comes back to one simple reason, and it was this. He said, because thou hast obeyed my voice. You see, there's such a close link, ladies and gentlemen, between, between faith and obedience. Such a close link. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. Thank goodness for stories like this, accounts of Scripture that we have. And the writer of Hebrews goes back, he, listen, he goes back into that vault and he pulls that story out to show us these dynamic truths. As you read that text I've read for you tonight out there in Hebrews 11. He wanted us to see by this example of Abraham 
what it was really to live by faith. You see, these Hebrew listeners, listen, they were, they were under persecution. They needed encouragement, and they needed to know that God was going to provide for them. And that's why he goes back and he uses this, this portrait of Abraham's walk with God, and he's offering up Isaac so that they could be encouraged to trust God despite the consequences by faith. That's why... That's why he does it, and that's why he uses it. You know, we've got this idea going around today, and I'm going to close. We've got this idea going to, around today that says, well, leave out the Old Testament. It's not relevant. <laughs> Folks, listen, I've done too much parallel through the years. That's a ludicrous statement. You see, what, again, what we see in the Old Testament is glimmer, but when you get to the New Testament, it's glitter. God uses so many times those references of those character profiles, those people, and he uses them once again in Hebrews chapter 11 to show us that, listen, that this, this life is uh, by faith is surreal, and, and we're going to have the same struggles. No, we're probably not going to be asked to lay down our son or daughter on the altar, but listen, we are, in a sense, going to be... Uh, asked to sacrifice some things of ourselves so that we can be obedient and so God can manifest himself to us. There's some things we're going to have to stay away from. There's some things we'll have to give up. There's some th lessons we're going to have to learn. There's some tests we're going to have to go through so that we can grow and mature and develop and be the friend of God that we need to be. And that's what we learn through Abraham by faith. I'm going to have Danny to come and play tonight. Uh, just three simple questions tonight as we stand to our feet out of this scripture. Three, three questions tonight. I want you to really ponder and think. For the most part tonight, this is the backbone of much of the church. You're faithful. You're here tonight to, to get in, or you wouldn't be here to go deeper and learn what God wants you to do in your life. Again, uh, going back to those three words to describe this occasion. First of all was worship. Can you honestly say, Lord, I'm giving you my best. Or maybe you found yourself lately in your walk with God not giving God your best. And you just need to simply come out, step out and come tonight and say, God, I, I, I've held out on you in some areas and I want to give you my best. Or maybe tonight you're giving your best, but you have some on your heart. Maybe tonight you just need to worship. Maybe it's been a while since you just got on your face. You come to face-to-face -to -face with God. Maybe it's been a while since you bowed your knee and said, God, I just want to praise you. I just want to thank you. I just want to exalt you. I'm here on my knees before you, I can't thank you enough for what you've done and what you're doing in my life. Thank you, Lord, for uh, that I've been saved by grace through faith. And, Lord, I just don't, don't want to ever get over it. Or maybe tonight you're here and maybe you just want to come and thank him for the offering of Jesus Christ because he took your place. He became that offering on the altar of death, the cross of Calvary for your sin. Maybe you just want to come and say, Lord, thank you for being my offering. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood and dying for us, oh, sinner like me. <laughs> Lord, I know I don't deserve it. But thank you, Lord Jesus, for grace and for the mercy you've had on my heart and life. And maybe tonight you just need to come and say, Lord, I just need to come to your altar. Maybe tonight you're challenged to set up a new altar at your house, at your place of business. Do you have an altar where you can go to regularly and get along with God? It might be in your car. It might be at your desk. It could be out back in a building, maybe in the woods, maybe a stump. I don't know where it's at, but do you, do you have an altar where you can lay yourself before God and say, Lord, I just want you to take all of me and use me. I want to be a sacrifice of praise. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the rich lessons we find here in Abraham's life of his offering up Isaac. And, Lord, we're so glad and so grateful uh, for the lessons and applications that we can get of walking by faith. Uh, Lord, I pray you speak to our hearts individually. I pray you speak to us collectively. Speak to us tonight as families. Lord, however, however you choose to speak, I pray now. I pray that we'd truly be obedient uh, 
in our worship of you. In Jesus' name, amen.